Hi, this is our final uh, lecture for the Healing Diaries. I can't believe we're at the end. It doesn't really feel like it. Um, still reading your work um, and we will have critiques going for a few more weeks. Keep writing, um, keep commenting. Don't be um, discouraged if you are behind on the reading or the exercises. You have a little bit more time. Um, I don't think I'll be reappearing on video, so this is goodbye from Glasgow. Um, but um, I may, I will be posting um, more material, a bibliography, um, possibly even um, readings that didn't quite make it into our syllabus. Um, I am overstuffing uh, your uh, list of readings for this week, so I have to apologize in advance, but there was too much. Um, to get to for our theme, which is old life and new life, um, silver linings. Um, that is about uh, finding something in this experience of, of illness um, or disability that uh, surprises us or um, uh, gives us a, a new perspective. Um, this becomes thematic in the readings, but also um, um, it additionally, uh, a rebirth, um, a special adaptation that is made, um, even uh, at moments of uh, reprieve um, or redemption. Uh, that sounds uh, spiritual. I think sometimes it is or it can be depending on um, your orientation and uh, some of the authors um, do view these moments as kind of uh, um, breakthroughs to some other some other kind of uh, mode of existence. Um, so we'll keep that in mind, but um, I'm not asking for um, in your writing this week that you must uh, force these observations by any means. Um, so it is um, uh, about a whole whole range of just um, perhaps uh, seeing sometimes the break in the clouds. So we are starting actually with a very old poem from 1798. Uh, I'm sure most of you know it, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who suffered uh, most mm -hmm. likely from bipolar depression and a, a kind of rheumatism. Um, he was an opium addict. Um, he was a great poet whose output uh, defeated him since he didn't write as much poetry as he wanted to after he was a young man. Um, he was a, a compatriot of uh, Wordsworth um, in, um, and, other, and a, a other romantic poets in the south of England in Somerset. Um, and this is uh, from, from his youth, this poem. Um, it's relevant to us because of the storytelling element, um, which clings to this uh, um, this man who's been uh, through a time of death and destruction on a ship, um, and how he arises from that with um, uh, the need, the compulsion to tell his tale. So, um, just a just a few stanzas here. This is the big, very beginning. Um, the argument: How a ship having passed the line was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole, and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. Part one. An ancient mariner meeteth three gallants bidden to a wedding feast and detaineth one. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three, by thy long beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set. Mayest hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off on hand me, gray beard loon. F soon his hand dropped he. The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake that ancient man, the bright eyed mariner. 
The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather till it reached the line. The sun came upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bassoon. The wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the mariner continueth his tale. The mariner um, gives this um, rendition of um, a terrible shipwreck um, and uh, the death of his um, many uh, fellow sailors um, after he cursed um, this bird, the albatross. And then from that point, he carried the albatross around his neck, which has this metaphoric meaning to us now of a terrible burden. Um, he's at fault for um, the, the uh, sudden demise of all of the shipmates. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the poem, or toward, actually, it's not quite the end. It's sort of the middle uh, this terrible suffering, this visitation of uh, death, this death in life on the ship, um, when he is alone with all these corpses, um, he, in his misery, looks out on the water and sees um, these creatures of the deep and has this response to them, which um, changes the tone of the poem. By the light of the moon, he beholdeth God's creatures of the great calm. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Their beauty and their happiness, he bless, blesseth them in his heart. O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The spell begins to break. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, that albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Um, so that is his own turning point, um, that blessing of the sea snakes, these sort of slimy, um, uh, scary um, creatures of the deep. Uh, somehow his, uh, his eyes uh, changed for this, the world around him. And he attributes that, um, that those, those flashes of light in the water, their scales um, uh, and and uh, the colors that he saw, that sort of wakes him up out of this stupor of, of death and pestilence. Um, so I encourage you to reread the poem. That's the very first reading of this week. Um, and then there's an exercise that relates to it, which I hope you will enjoy um, attempting. And then from uh, there, it's Borges on blindness. Um, Oliver Sacks, not the man who mistook his wife for a hat, um, but a new essay or a new essay called homeostasis, which is about Oliver Sacks' own illness and surgery um, for cancer in his liver. Um, it's a very short essay. Um, and I think it's interesting because he's the subject. Mark Braziadas and um, a newer book called uh, Bodies of Truth, this book of essays. He wrote an essay called Locked Into Life, which is his experience in a psychiatric ward, uh, which he thought he was not going to get out of. And then I think it was about a year after electric shock therapy, he actually was released and, and sort of what the, the course of that year looked like. Um, Tim O'Brien, uh, the author of And the Things They Carried, the Vietnam veteran, this uh, short story, it is fiction called Lives of the Dead, which is just... Um, breathtaking. I, I hope um, uh, that sticks with you. Somehow it does with me. It's It, it seems so real. It's about uh, a boy who remembers a girl he was in love with um, and didn't recognize for some time that she had cancer. She sort of disappeared from school one day 
Then uh, our last reading of the week will be Kia Brown and the, and the course, uh, The Pretty One. I may add something more, as I said, to the. it'll be in the resources for uh, anything I uh, couldn't fit on um, our um, itinerary this week. But The Pretty One is this very new work which just came out. Kia Brown is in her uh, mid, late 20s now. She has cerebral palsy. She's become a kind of uh, television internet sensation for, I think the hashtag is um, cute and disabled, I believe. Um, and she is um, a force to be reckoned with. We are going to read the last essay or last chapter in this memoir. Um, and then there, there's a, her, um, writing about uh, certain books that really saved her from sort of the worst possible outcome for herself, uh, that, which reminded me that uh, I have books like that, and um, you may too, or works of art, um, things that um, really helped you in a, a moment of crisis that had to do with uh, a failing, failing system or body or grief. Um, and uh, would, I would encourage you all to, to share those. I could certainly uh, uh, go back to mine. Sometimes it almost seems random which works those were, uh, but, but then they stay, they stay very dear to us. Um, I'm going to just read a little bit from Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat and this, uh, his preface and first chapter from that collection, which I, I also recommend uh, Oliver Sacks, the famous neurologist who died about uh, two years ago. My work, my life is all with the sick, but the sick and their sickness drives me to thoughts which perhaps I might otherwise not have, so much so that I am compelled to ask with Nietzsche. As for sickness, are we not almost tempted to ask whether we could get along without it? And to see the questions it, it raises as fundamental in nature. Constantly my patients drive me to question and constantly my questions drive me to my patients. Thus in the stories or studies which follow, there is a continual movement from one to the other. Studies, yes, why stories or cases? Hippocrates introduced the historical conception of disease, the idea that disease have a course from their first intimations to their climax or crisis and then to their happy or fatal resolution. Um, so, uh, what he is uh, pointing to here is the importance of stories beginning with Hippocrates and what is the case study, which is a kind of story of a patient and uh, what uh, Oliver Sacks is pointing to right here is how important that his patients are to him. They are his, his livelihood. He's connected to them um, and must tell their stories. Uh, that is uh, what he's doing in this particular book, which is all case studies of these different uh, brain traumas and diseases which affected the brain. Um, and some more, some, some more uh, excerpts from, from this. Classical fables have archetypal figures, heroes, victims, martyrs, warriors. Neurological patients are all of these, and in the strange tales told here, they are also something more. How in these mythical and metaphorical terms shall we categorize the lost mariner or the other strange figures of this book? We may say they are travelers to unimaginable lands, lands of which otherwise we should have no idea or conception. This is why their lives and journey seem to me to have a quality of the fabulous. Why have I used Osler's Arabian Nights image as the epigraph and why I feel compelled to speak of tales and fables as well as cases. The scientific and the romantic in such realms cry out to come together. Uh, in something Luria like to speak of as romantic science. They come together at the intersection of fact and fable, the intersection in which characterizes the lives of patients here narrated. That um, presence of myth and fable in, uh, in illness, um, which definitely um, I think is well illustrated by the Coleridge. And a um, couple more. Neurologi neuro neurology's favorite word is deficit. 
denoting an impairment or incapacity of neurological function, loss of speech, loss of language, loss of memory, loss of vision, loss of dexterity, loss of identity, and a myriad other lacks and losses of specific functions or faculties. For all of these dysfunctions, another favorite term, we have private privative words of every sort, aphonia, aphemia, aphasia, alexia, apraxia, agnosia, amnesia, ataxia, a word for every specific neural or mental function of which patients through disease or injury or failure to develop may find themselves partly or wholly deprived. So this whole vocabulary of deprivation and loss that's encoded in neuro neurology and also in medicine, um, just look at all those A's. Um, and I think that what, um, what Sachs wants to do is redress that lack and show um, some of the, uh, the special features of these patients, these special abilities that they um, suddenly had even um, when they lost who they were at an earlier point in their lives and became something else. Um, and then here's the last. It is then less deficits in the traditional sense which have engaged my interest the neurological disorders affecting the self. Such disorders may be of many kinds and may arise from excesses no less than impairments of function. And it seems reasonable to consider these two categories separately. But it must be said that from the outset, a disease is never a mere loss or excess, that there's always a reaction on the part of the affected organism or individual to restore, to replace, to compensate for and to preserve its identity, however strange that may, means may be, and to study or influence these means, no less than the primary insult to the nervous system is an essential part of our roles, uh, role as physicians. So that is where our focus is um, this week. It's um, those restorations, replacements, compensations, preservations of identity, those efforts that we make um, those new um, magical abilities sometimes that come to us in illness. Um, I haven't um, talked too much about um, my own uh, autoimmune disease, but I can say that after um, I've had chemotherapy, I have an extraordinary sense of smell. Um, I should be grateful for that. Um, also taste, I've become a super taster. Um, so there are some gains um, uh, on that side. So we are uh, looking at silver linings. Thank you for your wonderful writing thus far and in this course, and I hope I have a few more weeks uh, to look at it. Good night.